So it is brought to you today by Fristam Pumps, international manufacturer of sanitary centrifugal PD mixers and blenders, respected for unmatched performance, reliability, and technical superiority. We've been building pumps here um, in the greater part of the world since 1931, and today you can find our equipment in many of the top dairy, beverage, brewing, pharmaceutical, and food processing companies. Fristam Pumps USA, designed and manufactured in Middleton, Wisconsin. So here at Fristam Pumps, we have two dedicated mixing and blending product managers so that they can focus solely on providing expert solutions for customers. Uh, their names are Chip Nips and Dan Oshadatz. And today, one of them will be our presenter, Dan Oshadatz. He has over 20 years of experience in the industry, and I will turn the presentation now over to Dan. Buddy. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> As Dan said, I'm Dan Oshadatz, the one on the right. So for today's presentation, I'm going to be going through four different parts. Uh, we're going to start off just going through reviewing some typical types of mixing and blending technologies. Then I'll go back through those same technologies and talk about some of the advantage, advantages and disadvantages of using each one. After that, we'll talk briefly about some common powders and products in the food industry, but then we'll bring that all together at the end and talk about how we would go about choosing the best system in each of those types of applications. So starting off, I'll go through those types of mixing and blending technologies, and I have them broken into two parts. The first part would be in-tank mixer solutions, and the second part would be in-line mixer solutions external to the tank. So when I talk about in-tank mixers, it'll be any type of tank with a mixer or agitator inside where you would expect to dump the dry ingredients over the top or through a manway and then allow the agitator in the tank to do all of the mixing. So the first one that I'll show you is the most common. It's a simple agitator. In this case, you see it's a lightning mixer. It would be mounted to the uh, top of the tank, and then the agitator extends down, and that prop that you see at the end of the shaft would rotate inside the tank to do the mixing. Typically, they're paired directly with the tank, so either this is going to be designed to fit in a particular tank or the tank is going to be designed around a particular agitator. And I would consider this type of agitator to be low intensity. It's basically like a slow stir. The next type that I have is a bottom entry agitator, and as you can see by the picture, this would typically be something like a liquefier, a Bretto liquefier or a liquiverter. This is mounted to the bottom of the tank and just the mix head comes straight through. And this would stir and or agitate the tank. And I would consider this more of a medium intensity. It runs at a higher RPM, but it doesn't have a rotor and stator set up to give you really high shear. The next type would be another top entry, but this would be a top entry high shear. So like the lightning mixer, this would be mounted to the top of the tank and would be paired with a particular tank design. So this would also agitate the tank, but in this case, we have a rotor stator head design. So there's a rotor spinning inside that cage, and then it's pushing the product through the slots. And different heads would be available with different slot sizes or different rotor configurations, depending on what you were trying to do to your product inside the tank, whether that was dispersing solids or trying to create an emulsion. And this would be more of a high intensity mixer, so higher shear rates. The next type I have on here would be a side entry, also a bottom entry uh, mixer, but more likely a side entry mixer. So this is a complete mixer setup that can be installed into an existing tank with some modifications. So this would be installed on the side of the tank, would also then agitate the contents of the tank and have a rotor stator design, just like the, uh, the top entry high shear. You would also have different head configurations available for this. As you can see, the tiny little holes that are on the current setup, you can get different uh, rotor stator setups depending on what you're trying to do inside the tank. This would also be a high intensity mixer. The next set of mixers that I'm gonna go through would be inline mixers. So in this case, the ingredients could either be put into the tank and then pumped through the uh, inline mixer or you can operate these with an induction funnel 
or pump ahead of it so that you draw the ingredients from a funnel into the stream and then feed it through the blender. But in either case, the uh, commonality here is that all the product has to go through the inline mixer and will be mixed before it gets back to the tank. These can be operated in recirculation or in single pass, depending on what the product is and what you're trying to address. So the first one that I have on here is one of the most common that you would see in the industry. It's been around since the uh, 1970s. This would be the tri-blender. So in this case, you have a funnel with a centrifugal pump head uh, located below it. The pump is facing straight up the inlet of the pump. And this would spin and create a vortex at the bottom of the cone. And you would add your solids or liquids down through the cone into that vortex where the pump impeller that's inside the head would push that product through a perforated screen to try and mix it and return it to the tank or pass it on to the uh, next tank if you were doing single pass. I would consider this a low intensity because it's really just a centrifugal pump with a pump screen. The next one that I have up here is a colloid mill. This is, it would be an inline mixer where you would pump the contents from the tank through the uh, colloid mill. In this case, you have a variable gap. So if you look at the picture, you can see that it has sort of a cone shape to the front. The rotor is shaped exactly like that cone, and then the cover is the inverse of that cone. So you can adjust the, the cover piece in and out to create a uh, tight or wide open gap inside. The gap can go as small as 0.1, uh, 10 thousandths of an inch, sorry. And this allows you to create an extremely tight emulsion. So typically these would be used uh, for liquid on liquid mixing, where you're trying to get a very small droplet size of one of the liquids into the other. Uh, example would be like mayonnaise or dressing. Next one would be a piston homogenizer. And this similar to the colloid mill, you have extremely high intensity and you're gonna be pushing your product into it, except in this case, instead of having the rotating cone with an adjustable gap, you're gonna have a, a homogenizing valve and a piston pump that's pushing the product through that. So you can vary the amount of pressure that the pump is pushing with to alter the amount of shear that the product is gonna see. And this would also be a very high intensity mixer that can create a very tight uh, emulsion. Next mixer I have on here is a shear pump. In this case, it's both a pump and a mixer. So this can replace an existing centrifugal pump and be able to move the product while mixing it. So it's using about half the motor horsepower to move the product and about half to do the mixing. You can vary the RPM on a unit like this to change the amount of flow or the amount of shear that the product is gonna see. And this can be considered high intensity as well. The next version that we have would be something more like a shear blender where it's not pumping the product, it's only uh, shearing it and mixing it. So you would have an additional pump that moves the product through this and this, all of the horsepower consumed by this would be used uh, to put energy into the product, whether that's turbulence or shear, again, depending on what you're trying to do to your product. There are, for this version, there are different heads available depending on if you want high shear or if you have a uh, more viscous product that uh, you need to simply work a little bit. The last one that I have brings a couple of elements together. So like the tri-blender in the beginning, this has an induction funnel with a pump to bring the powders in line ahead of the blender, and then it's forcing them through the same blender that we talked about on the last slide. So in this case, you get, you're able to uh, meter your solids in line, draw them in with a vacuum, and then feed them through the shear blender on their way back to the tank or on their way to their second location. So that was just briefly some of the technologies that exist. And now I'm gonna go through each of those technologies again and give you an idea of some of the advantages and disadvantages of using each one. So broken down, same as before, in-tank mixers and in-line mixers. So the first one, the Lightman mixer or simple agitator. Some of the pros or the, the advantages of this, it's, it's inexpensive. 
It's very simple for the operator. This is something where they'll run the agitator, throw the, con throw the, the ingredients into the tank and let the agitator run. They tend to have very low power consumption because they're operating at low RPM. These are really more about using torque to spin the impeller head instead of uh, high speed creating shear. These can also be retrofitted into tanks. As you can see in the picture, it has a clamping arrangement that would connect to the top edge of a tank or to a plate that would be welded to the top of the tank. Some of the disadvantages are once you mount this to a tank, it's really limited, your batch size is really limited to the size of that tank. So if you put this on your 500 gallon tank, you can only do batches up to 500 gallons. Also, it's very low intensity. So if you're doing more difficult solids, which we'll talk about a little bit later, those solids aren't gonna wanna mix. They're just going to sort of float around and be pushed around the tank. So it can leave you with a lot of undissolved solids if you're doing more difficult powders, like let's say cocoa powder. The next mixer that we talked about was the liquefier or bottom entry tank mixer. Again, uh, for the operator, very easy to dump the ingredients into that top port. So it's simple for the operator. They dump them in, hit the go button and stand back and let it mix. Also, it's a completely integrated unit. So when you bring this in, you have a mixer and a tank that are already designed to work together. Some of the disadvantages of this type of setup, it's gonna require a platform for the operators. As you can maybe can't tell from the picture, the top of that liquefier might be six or eight feet in the air so that people are gonna to have to work you know, off an elevated platform. One of the other disadvantages, because there's so much surface area that's being turned over by this impeller blade, it's going to introduce a lot of air into your product. So that surface becomes very turbulent and it creates a vortex that can draw that air down into your product. These will also leave a lot of undissolved solids and you're limited to the size of the tank that you purchase. So if you buy a 200 gallon liquefier, that's the size batch you're gonna do. Next one that I have is the top entry high shear mixer. So again, like all the others, it's simple for the operator. You have the mixer in the tank, you turn it on and start mixing, dump your, your ingredients into the tank and sit back and wait for it to go. Uh, it will also work in conjunction or combination with other mixers in the tank. So if you have the simple agitator that's turning the contents of the tank, you can also then have the high, high shear top entry located off to the side in the tank doing the high shear mixing. So the two can work together to uh, help speed up and improve your results. Also, this can be retrofitted into an existing tank with small modifications. Drawbacks, again, like most tank mixing applications, it can leave a lot of undissolved solids if you're mixing powders that are more difficult to mix and when you add them to the tank, they might float or stick to the sidewall and never actually be drawn back through the mixing head. You're also limited to the tank size as you are with any other. Once you put your mixing solution in a tank, you're limited to that tank. This can also create some long batch times as you wait for the product to be drawn through the mix head. The larger the batch, the longer it's gonna take for all of the contents of the tank to eventually be drawn through. Similar issues with this side entry high shear. You know, the advantages, it's simple to operate. Turn on the mixer and dump your powders in and it works in combination with other mixers in the tank. This one especially well because it doesn't come in from the top with a long shaft, but it's just mounted to the side of the tank, mostly flush with the side wall creating its, its flow pattern. So much larger agitators and paddles will work with this type of mixer. Drawbacks are the same though as the last, uh, last slide we looked at. Potential for undissolved solids that stick or float in the tank. Limited to that tank size once you mount it. And this can create long batch times of certain powders while you're waiting for them to be drawn through the mixer. When we look at our inline solutions for the tri-blender, biggest advantage for the tri-blender is it, it's affordable. You know, it's, it's a eight or $9,000 piece of equipment. You get the funnel and, and it will draw your solids into the stream. And, it, and it, it works very well for simple, highly soluble powders like salts and sugars. When you add them to the funnel, you'll have that vortex at the bottom. Those salts and sugars will hit the vortex and begin dissolving immediately and go into solution. One of the biggest drawbacks of the tri-blender is the fact that it will plug quite frequently. As you're dumping powders, those powders can stop that vortex from spinning. And when that stops, 
liquid starts to fill up into the funnel and wet the rest of your powder. So the most common tool you'll see with somebody operating a tri blender is a long uh, metal stick that they push down into the funnel to break up those plugs at the bottom and try to get it flowing again. Another drawback to this is it does rely on a vortex. So if you're adding solids that will change the viscosity of your fluid, as that viscosity changes, your vortex becomes weaker inside this hopper and it will draw powders slower and eventually stop pulling the powders in altogether. Also, it's not very ergonomic. It may look compact in the picture, but the top of that funnel is probably around five feet in the air. So people will have to work off a step or two to get up to the top of this funnel and add, add your solids. The other drawback is most of these are quite old. So they've been in operation for a long time. They operate using a belt and, and pulley system underneath the base. And that belt, belt and pulley system as it gets older and misaligned can lead to frequent maintenance issues having to replace those parts. The colloid mill, like all of the following inline solutions that we're gonna talk about, allows you to mix 100% of the product that comes in the inlet. So as long as you get the product into the inlet, it will come out fully mixed. Another great advantage of a colloid mill is you can now create submicron droplet size of your, of your product. So if you're doing an emulsion, and the key there is getting those oil droplet size very small, this can get below one micron size and in a very tight distribution. So most of the droplets will be of that uniform size. Another great advantage is you do have the ability to vary the gap and the shear rate of this by moving the uh, cover in and out so that it can give you uh, a very controlled droplet size coming out and a very consistent repeatable result. Disadvantages of the colloid mill, you do have to remove the rotor for CIP. So you do have to disassemble the cover, remove the rotor, reassemble it, and then you can run it in a CIP loop. Also, the sizes tend to be very small, so they're limited in flow rate, typically up to maybe 30 or 40 gallons per minute at the most uh, running through one of these. And when it comes to powder dispersion, a colloid mill is definitely overkill uh, for what you're trying to accomplish. So you, you're stuck with a very low flow rate and extremely high shear rates, which aren't necessary for dispersing most powders. Next one on the list, piston homogenizer, again, capable of mixing 100% of the product that's going to go in the inlet, creates a submicron droplet size, excellent, and a very tight particle distribution. Uh, so a lot of that, like the colloid mill, uh, drawbacks here are they are very expensive. It's a very expensive investment up front, and the long-term maintenance investment is significantly higher than operating something like, let's say, the colloid mill. Also, if you do run undissolved powders through the piston homogenizer, it will result in extreme wear on the mechanical components. And that can also be very expensive, both from purchasing new parts and having to put them in, but also the downtime you're gonna get from this machine. And it is definitely overkill for powder dispersion. It's more than you would ever need to disperse powders and get them fully wetted. Next one on the list is the shear pump. 100% of the product can be mixed going through. In this case, unlike your in-tank solutions, these you can have an infinite batch size because this can be connected really to any tank or operated in single pass as you move product from point A to point B. Also, they can be added to any system. So you could buy one shear pump. They can be located on any system in the plant simply by breaking into the piping and adding it in the loop. A shear pump's also, because of its ability to pump, capable of replacing a centrifugal pump you may already have in the system and then using this to both pump the product and uh, fix your problem with any mixing. Drawbacks to this is it will use a lot more power than the pump that it's replacing. So if you take a centrifugal pump out that was a five horsepower centrifugal pump, you can expect that the shear pump you put in its place is gonna be more like a 10 or 15 horsepower in order to be able to both maintain that pumping duty, but also shear and blend your product. Also, if you have, if you're operating this by adding your powders to the tank and trying to recirculate them, if you're adding powders that float on the surface, those powders won't ever make it to the shear pump for, for mixing. They'll just stay in your tank floating until you empty it. Shear blender, a lot of the same characteristics as the shear pump, except in this case, the shear blender is not trying to pump your product. So all of the power that we're using with the motor is being dedicated to working your product with either shear 
or turbulence to get it mixed. It can also be added to any system. And because we're adding this with, while well, keeping the other pump in the system, it can handle higher viscosity. So if you've got a more viscous product that you're pumping with a positive displacement pump or a twin screw pump, the shear blender can be added after it and you push your product through and it can handle products that a shear pump wouldn't be able to pump. Drawbacks is again, it will use more power than just that pump by itself and fl powders that float in the tank will never be pushed through the shear blender. And then the last one that we talked about earlier is, is the powder mixer setup where you have a pump inducting powders with vacuum from the funnel and then pushing them through the shear blender. So here you now get 100% of the product mixed, but you also can make be sure that the powders you're adding to the system will be fully mixed before they ever get back to your tank. So instead of adding powders to the tank and having them float, this is able to fully disperse them. And when they get to the tank, they will wet out and, and uh, dissolve rapidly. And here it's more, a more ergonomic solution. So the operators using this can work from the floor they're able to stand and work at a waist height funnel and add the solids or liquids into the stream without having to climb or stand on a deck. Drawbacks, you're limited to the funnel capacity. So while adding bags of powder, you can only fit one or two bags of powder in the funnel at one time. So the operators are gonna have to stay with the powder mixer until all of the solids are added to the batch. So that's a, a run through on our mixing technologies. What I'm gonna go into now, we'll just uh, briefly talk about a few common powders and ingredients that we've seen in the, uh, in the food industry. And then I'll talk about how we would be choosing the best system to handle some of those powders. So the list that I have on the screen are some very common powders and ingredients in the food industry. On the left, you'll see powders that dissolve so they are typically added in greater concentrations to slurries and products. And they're a little bit more forgiving because you can add them at higher rates to your product and still get them mixed. Uh, very common nonfat dry milk, sugar, cocoa powder, salt, whey protein concentrate, uh, flour. And on the right, you'll see powders that are more difficult. So these powders, when added to your, to your product or slurry, these will absorb moisture and thicken and change the viscosity of the product. Uh, things like pectin and xanthan gum will be added. Xanthan gum would be added at, let's say, a 1% to 2% maximum into your product, and that can take a liquid and turn it into something more of the consistency of a gel. So some of the common food mixing applications that, that we've seen in our years in the food industry uh, oil and water emulsions, uh, making salsas and hot sauces, um, mayonnaise, salad dressings. So with that, I'm going to get into the end part of the presentation where now we're going to talk about how we would choose the uh, best system for an application. When we look at choosing the best system, there's really four criteria that we're going to look at to determine what's going to be the best fit. Uh, the first one's going to be, you know, if we're looking for the quality of the mixed product. The second, the time and or speed of the process, how long it takes to, to do the job. The safety and or ergonomics for the operators. And then lastly, whether this is an existing installation or we have a clean slate and we're starting from scratch. So when I talk about the quality of the mixed product, we, we look at some of those ingredients that were on that, that chart a couple slides ago and really break them down into three categories. The first one are powders that blend easily, things like sugars and salts. They're usually added in very large quantities, you know, let's say up to 70% for sugars, and they're the least expensive by weight. Next, we've got powders that are more difficult like starch and cocoa, and these are usually added in those quantities 20 to 40%, they're a little bit more expensive by weight. The last ones are the extremely difficult powders like gums and stabilizers. And these are, as I mentioned earlier, added in very small quantities, but these are the most expensive powders that are gonna be added to your product. 
when we talk about the time and speed of the process, there's really two different types of time that it's going to take to do these batches. One is the time that it takes to get the ingredients into the batch, the time the operator is actually interacting with the tank or the funnel. And then there's the time for those ingredients to actually dissolve or fully mix into your product. When you're dumping ingredients directly into the top of the tank, it'll give you the shortest amount of time for the operator to get the ingredients into the batch. However, that typically leads to the longest amount of time to actually get them fully dissolved or dispersed in the tank. The second one would be if you're inducting those ingredients in line, this is the part that's going to take the longest interaction by the operator to get them in as they fill the funnel and maintain it flowing into the fluid stream. However, once that's into the fluid stream, it's generally fully mixed already. So now that's the shortest amount of time that you're going to have to keep running the mixers to get the product fully dissolved. When it comes to safety and or ergonomics, we're either looking at adding the ingredients directly to the tank where it's going to require ladders or mezzanines or some other platform for the operator to work from. And this requires both them going up high, but also lifting the ingredients to the top of the tank. So you're either going to be taking one bag at a time up a ladder or stairs, or you're going to be hoisting with a forklift an entire pallet of powders up onto the deck for the operator to work with up high. Conversely, you have adding ingredients in line where most solutions you can work from the floor level or maybe off a one or two step platform, but still maintaining, you know, keeping the operators low where you have less of a fall hazard or less climbing. And then the last point, whether it's an existing or new installation. For existing installations, what we really want to do is we want to identify the specific issue that you're having, whether it be the quality of your product, the amount of time it takes, or the safety, and then look at just replacing or upgrading the, the components needed to fix that problem. You know, we don't, nobody wants to come in with a solution where we tell you take everything out of your plant and start over. However, if you are starting with a new installation, it gives you the opportunity to really look at all of those factors and determine what's going to be the best solution to meet all of those criteria. So when we look at easy powders, really any of those mixing solutions are going to work to get the product mixed. There's going to be large quantities of powder typically, so we're going to be looking at something that gets them into the tank fast so that you're not spending hours just dumping powders. Also, in this case, ergonomics and safety can have a really strong influence here. We can look at inline induction only solutions that don't require mixers, so operators can work from the floor, add their solids, and get them up into the tank. One solution might be the uh, uh, tri blender that we looked at in the beginning, or the powder mixer without the blender. So it would just be the front end for powder induction, and that would help you to get those solids up into the tank where the agitator in the tank can finish it because these are easy powders. Or you may also, if you have enough powder, you may look at a conveying solution where you use an auger or an air blow to push the powders directly into the tank where the agitator can take care of them. And in any of these cases, just having a low intensity mixer in the tank can generally get the job done. It just needs to stir until they dissolve. When we look at the medium difficulty powders, we're talking about things like starch and cocoa. And these, when they get wet, they will start to clump right away. So if you dump a 50 pound bag of cocoa or starch into a tank, you're gonna make a lot of baseball and softball sized chunks of the uh, powder that are gonna float or stick to the side walls of the tank. So when you run that, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time to eventually get those pulled through and mixed. But if you spend enough time, if time isn't an issue, you can just run your in-tank mixers until they are fully mixed. And as I mentioned earlier, these will require medium to high intensity. So, you know, either a bottom entry, side entry, or top entry, high shear mixer. So these medium to difficult ingredients, you'll throw them in the top of the tank. You'll allow enough time for agitation. But one thing that you can do is add an inline mixer, either a shear pump or a shear blender with your existing pump, and recirculate the tank while you're adding. And what this will do is allow you to reduce that amount of time that it takes for them to be blended 
and reduce the amount of lost ingredients by getting them more thoroughly dispersed. The next level solution for this would be inducting those powders in line and forcing them through some type of blender prior to getting into the tank. And what this will do is it will ensure that every bit of powder that gets into your tank is fully dispersed before it ever gets to the tank. And typically once the last powder has been dumped in and fed to the tank, you no longer need to run the recirculation loop for mixing and the simple agitator in the tank can finish the job because you've already fully dispersed your powders. When we look at these difficult powders, these gums and stabilizers, and if you're not familiar with stabilizers, stabilizers are typically a mixture of gums specific to the product that you're working on. These tend to clump and float because of their low density as a powder. They'll form a rubber coating around that baseball sized chunk, float to the top of the tank and just sit there floating for hours. So a significant, significant percentage of these powders will never be mixed if you're using a uh, top entry or side entry mixer in the tank. So it's not uncommon for these powders to have the recipe altered if the final solution needed 2% of a powder, you'll often see three or more percent added to the mixture because they know they will get their 2% mixed and they'll lose the rest of it into the filters or it'll be left in the tank when they empty it out. So again, just like the medium difficulty solutions, you can add your ingredients to the top of the tank, let the uh, agitator or shear in the tank begin the mixing process, and then you can recirculate the tank uh, while that's happening to try and cut back on the amount of lost powders and the amount of time it takes to get the finished blend. Or you can go with the inline solution where you can induct these powders at a very low rate because the final mixture of these might be anywhere from one to 10%. We will control the, we would control the induction rate in let's say the 10 to 15% range to be sure that what's going through the inline blender has enough available liquid to fully disperse on the first pass. And that will make sure that when it gets to the tank, it's fully wetted out and starts to hydrate. And in this case, usually you could recirculate for a couple minutes after all the powders in to be sure that you've got everything mixed well. And after that, the easy, the simple agitator in the tank will uh, finish the mixture and let it fully hydrate. So that's all I have for our presentation here. Thank you very much. Okay, ready for some questions, Dan? I am. Okay, first question. What are the most common mistakes you see when people set up their mixing system? So the most common mistake that I see when people are setting up their mixing system is, is underestimating how difficult it's gonna to be to mix some of their powders. You know, I think people tend to take for granted that if you throw them in a take and run a mixer, that they're going to fully mix. But what really happens is as you go from a small pilot batch, where it might be a blender like you have in your kitchen, where, you know, an extra minute gets the job done, when you get into the actual production setup and you put your shear mixers in the tank, and now you have two or 3,000 gallons, you find out that it's going to take three or four hours for that to finally get your product mixed. So I think underestimating how difficult some of those powders are to actually wet out. Okay, next question. Do manufacturers offer product trials and what are some tips I should keep in mind when trialing a mixing system? Yes, I can at least speak for the inline mixer. Uh, all of the companies that I know of offer trials. And, and it's a very common way to prove out that, that technology, especially since a lot of customers are really only familiar with the tank solutions because they're a lot more simple to, to grasp. Uh, when you look at these inline solutions, almost all, all the companies will offer trials. And the important thing with the trials is to make sure that when you look at what you're gonna do on the trial, that you very specifically tell the manufacturer what you're going to be looking at as far as a batch and what your measurements are going to be to say whether or not it's a success, because that will allow the manufacturer to be sure they send the correct sized and configured equipment to you to actually run that process. Okay. Next question. Price-wise, how do the different mixers compare? When you look at the, the so 
separate from each other, the, as I mentioned, the piston homogenizers can be incredibly expensive. But if you look at any of the other high shear solutions, they're all, as far as the components by themselves, going to be very similar. You know, they all have a rotor stator set up with a close gap, and they all have a high-speed motor that's going to run, and they're all going to use about the same amount of horsepower. So the, the equipment themselves are going to be all very similar. I think the biggest differences will come if you buy an intake solution, you also are going to have to deal with the cost of modifying the tank and adding the pieces you need to get that solution into a tank that you already have. On the slide about time, what is the typical total time for in-tank versus in-line? So for that one, I'll use an example of pectin into water. Uh, so let's say somebody was doing an 8 to 9% pectin mixture that's going to become very viscous. If you were to simply take a tank with an in-tank high shear and the proper agitation in the tank, throw your 8 to 9% pectin into the tank and rely on the, simply what's in the tank to get it mixed, you might be looking at two to three hours of process time before all of that pectin has finally been drawn, all the powder has been drawn through the mixer and has been fully dispersed. Whereas if you took that same batch and ran it through an inline solution where you can induct it at a proper ratio as it passes through the blender prior to getting to the tank, you would reduce that two to three hours to something more like 15 to 30 minutes total process time. Okay. If we use a big tank, which in-tank mixer type is best or does it depend on what we're mixing? So both, if you're using a very large volume tank, uh, the type of high shear mixer you're gonna pick is just gonna depend on the product you're mixing and how you wanna work it, whether it's an emulsion, or a dispersion, or if you're trying to disperse gums and get them uh, hydrated, the type of high shear mixer you put in the tank is going to be the same regardless of the batch size. However, as you get to the larger tanks, what you really want to make sure of is that you also have secondary agitation in the tank that can turn the contents and keep what you're working in the tank equal in all parts of the tank. So that might be large paddles that can push the contents of the tank or being sure that the prop agitator that's in the tank is able to turn the tank over frequently during your mixing process. Okay, thank you, Dan. That's all the questions that have come through. So I appreciate you taking the time to do the presentation today. And to everyone who joined us, yep. and to everyone who joined us, we hope that you discovered some valuable information or some ideas on how to improve your mixing product. If you have any questions or need any help in the future, please feel free to contact Dan, Chip, or honestly anyone at Fristam. So thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.